Hello, folks, and welcome to another episode of Marketing Cheat Codes. My name is Ed Briel, CMO at Aprimo, and I'm super excited today to have Kyle Hufford on. Uh, Kyle, you're an executive digital strategist. Uh, you work with data governance, organizational alignment, and some really cool technology, AI, machine learning, and um, you've got an awesome career that you've uh, really been the behind some genius brands that the digital experiences and really excited to uh, to have you on the show today. Thank you, Ed. My pleasure to be here. Awesome. So let, let's start with um, what kind of pressure in, in a role like that, where you're, you've got the, the technology, there's a brand experience, a content experience with these genius brands, the pressure or the uh, the excitement that either keeps you up at night or has you going in every day um, to know that you're responsible for that. How does that feel? Uh, <laughs> well, I guess for me, it's something I thrive on. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know if I would equate it to pressure uh, in that manner. Uh, my entire life, I've, you know, just to give you a quick background, I, I actually grew up on Maui uh, in a photo lab. So I've been one who, who's been taught to solve things my entire life. So I, I end up being the, the person who finds the weird bugs or the weird things to solve or the, the weird components. So I, I would say that the big challenge for us, I, I would say in, in all of the years is definitely dirty data. Um, that, that's one of the things that I don't know what, it, like it consumes my mind 100%, like trying to automate things from system A to system B. The biggest challenge we have is dirty data. It all, everything, every conversation I have, it gets back to the, hygiene, the quality, the completeness uh, of data, because data is really the, it's the, the lifeblood. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think a lot of people don't understand that when you have multiple tool sets or multiple applications or systems that utilize the same data, and you decide that, oh, I'm just going to go and change it in a downstream system that now you've, you've created this uh, animal or monster. <laughs> Because you, you don't have to feed it with, you know, more staffing and more individuals uh, to, to keep the monster going instead of having it, you know, feeding from a direct source. Wow. So so data and plus content, that is, I mean, there's just so much we're going to talk about today. So this is marketing cheat codes, and we're, we're really excited for you to bring some cheat codes uh, to the show today and talk about those uh, for folks uh, but then, get, just getting back to you again, tell me about your your origin story. You you started you started in Hawaii, and now you're <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So i I grew up in a photo lab. I started working at a very young age. My dad's a professional photographer, and and uh, so you know somebody had to grow up on Maui. Um, and everybody asked me why'd you move away. <laughs> and uh, you know, by the time I was sixteen, I was running the lab, and and I just decided that there wasn't enough. Um, there wasn't enough differentiation between like home and work. You know, there was, we'd be at the breakfast table and I'd get asked about jobs. And I'm like, no, I just need work-life balance. And I know that's been a big subject, you know, especially during these COVID times, everybody kind of like, whoa, we, people have finally found work-life balance. And now we're going back to the office. And uh, so I ended up moving out to California and I, my grandparents live out here and I worked for a, a surf company and ended up, working there for about 15 and a half years. And I started as a graphic designer. And next thing I know, I was the librarian. So beta tapes would show up on my desk and I had to get them converted. And, and uh, we created our own like physical library. Um, we tried to implement a digital asset management system. But the key, I, I would say, success that we had there was actually the building of our catalog. So we actually automated the building of catalogs. I, I don't know how much you're uh, familiar with apparel, but in the apparel industry, especially like a surf brand, they have about oh, about 4,000 SKUs every quarter. So that's quite a bit of products that have information that put together. And so we actually automated the building of the catalogs by exporting the data directly from our, uh, our ERP system and then pairing that with images from the dam in through InDesign. So instead of us having to spend two weeks to build the catalog, it was a click a couple hours, it put together, and then if data was bad, we said, okay, go fix it in the ERP and give us another export. <laughs> so, so this is, uh, for folks, this would be like um, uh, product information, 
uh, metadata uh, information around uh, placement for the catalog, uh, master, other master data associated with the products. Is that right? Yeah. So everything from, you know, wholesale pricing, um, information about the product. So like in apparel, it would be like, what's the mix of the material? Is it, is it cotton, polyester? What, what's the blend? You know, what, what's the information that we store in our ERP to sell it with? And then also the item numbers, the material numbers, so that um, somebody in sales could actually go through. And the next step of that uh, evolution that we took was we actually started building uh, digital PDFs from there that you could actually click through and order directly within the ERP system. So we had an online tool system that we kind of, we took, you know, the, this physical catalog that used to be just, you know, I hate to say it, but we used to print on this like terrible material. We, we called it like printing on toilet paper because we <laughs> we had to print like the cheapest possible catalog out there to do these. Yeah. Um, and, you know, over time it got better and better. We eventually started doing color. And, and the biggest challenge was definitely um, capturing photographs of the, uh, of the items that that was that was the biggest thing because as what happened was after the catalogs happened we we really had to figure out how to transition to e-commerce and so they launched e-commerce and now all of a sudden you know we would shoot one picture of a shirt or one picture of a t-shirt before maybe a front and a back and now for online they wanted like nine angles right this was before people right. figured out that you know five angles is really the ideal amount of images you need for e-commerce and so we went from like a front and a back shot to all of a sudden we were shooting on like mannequins and and photoshopping in the necks and <laughs> we were post processing in india like you know so so the biggest challenge was definitely not the um the data cuz at that point we actually had automated from the erp system the the catalog information and so the the file naming even out of the cameras was automated it was just a copy and paste so instead of somebody having to re key in oh material number description etc they just copy and paste directly in there hit a button it post processes we upload to india we receive it back stick it in our dam click the button to build the cat so that th those are definitely i i would see a, a lot of the unsung heroes within like marketing groups and, and places that build catalogs for that because that's like a big big piece and that that was a you know that was a number of years i spent doing that and, and since then i've moved on i'm actually in the beverage industry now and supporting the uh marketing teams and it's been really exciting um the, the excitement there and, and the challenges there are that we had a lot of tool sets and a lot of pieces that were working well but they were just not connected or siloed and so the big challenge that we've had is how do we start people utilizing the same application or the same system across the organization because we're all trying to achieve the same goal? Yeah, unifying the data set, unifying the content. In, in there, you really, over a timeline, you've unpacked, I like to talk about, uh, talk about it quite a bit, the four Vs of content, the volume, variety, the velocity, and the veracity and this move from uh, traditional print on toilet paper to, yeah. <laughs> the, to the to the digital uh, world, uh, and even now, um, you know that that volume that um, that need for all the different varieties and formats, and now the the volumes are exponential. Given the channels are exponential, given the need for all the the different angles you talked about to give like the 360 degree view spin sets, potentially um, the veracity now that, that I like to call it the, you know, the truth in content or even now I was actually on a, uh, listening to a talk uh, by a colleague last night. We were, we were talking about crypto, the blockchain and its applicability to content and the, the authenticity of what the blockchain can potentially do. Um, for, for, for marketers and content. So you've, you're living through that. Um, so now what are your thoughts on the, the complexity side of the, the speed at which digital needs to move? Well, I think the challenge is, is that a lot of people who are working in marketing um, and one of the pieces is, is you always have to realize it's people process technology in that order. Um, and so in my prior uh, employment to where I'm at now, 
um, I was on the marketing side. Um, now, and I was actually playing a, an IT role in the marketing group. And now I, I report into the CIO and I work on the IT side, but supporting marketing. It's very interesting seeing, seeing the, the differences because with what I would consider like digital asset management, um, marketing automation, you know, how do we get these digital things out there? A lot of organizations struggle with where does it report, right? Does this report to the CMO? Does it report to the CIO? Is it a, a dual reporting role? Does it report into sales or sales ops? You know, so, so I think every organization, depending on what the culture is, has figured out what works best on those different pieces and, and how it works. And so back to sort of the people process technology component is a lot of times what we end up doing is when, when I first implemented the tool where I'm at today, I was about six years ago, um, I was working with an outside company and we did something that was really, really important. And a lot of people don't want to spend the time doing it, but we spent about three months with the graphic design team, and with the marketing team. And we, we built out in lucid chart, a process flow. How do we get work done today? Sort of what's our as is? And then talk through all the pain points and, and all the pieces. And, and basically what I learned is that in order to implement a dam within a, a graphic design department, you need to become a very good therapist. <laughs> you need to sit there <laughs> and you need to listen to the designers, to understand, to commiserate with them, you know, tell them, oh, yeah, you're doing a great job, et cetera. And then, you know, at the end of the day, then you need to say, okay, cool. Well, now can you change how you do this? Can you now adjust your workflow by this one step or two steps? And really the big piece where, where we got a lot of traction there is, you know, sort of that people process. We walked through what was the as is, what was the to be, and then we said, okay, because it's going to be complicated, we're only going to, we're going to let you do whatever you did before up to this point, these sort of milestones along the way, right? So we say, hey, at, at this milestone, which is our first review process, you're going to upload your PDF to a re review tool. Can you do that? Sure, I'll do that, no problem. And at this point, with our final review, we're gonna go ahead and upload it to it. Okay, cool, we could do that. So, so I think a lot of it comes with also change management, right? Understanding mm -hmm. the culture of the people so that they can, they can really take in and understand what change is gonna happen. I think a lot of times and a lot of challenges, especially when you know, marketers or people in marketing ops look at these pieces is, is they see a tool, they're like, oh, cool, shiny new tool. And then they come out and they look at it, they're like, cool. And then when they go to implement it, the, the challenge is, is that's when all of the pieces come out, right? All of the dirty little details like, oh, well, in order for this to work the way that we showed you in the demo, <laughs> you need to have this type of data ready. Or in order for this type of report to happen, you need to have this piece ready. And so it's that, that the unknown of, of what it is. And so the big challenge that I deal with today is, is, is people come and say, oh, well, I'm going to use, I don't know, Monday.com or, you know, Asana or whatnot. And, and those are not bad solutions. Don't get me wrong. Those are not, you know, you know, or maybe they want to use an, a marketing tool. But, but my point with that is, is that they don't look at the process in which how they work today. They just say, oh, this tool is going to solve my problem. I say, okay, cool. That's a wrench, but you need a hammer. Right. And so I, I think there's a, a lot. And then the other big thing that I want to talk about people and process is a lot of organizations have a challenge where the business doesn't understand how to articulate what they want with technology. And the technology partner or the IT department doesn't, doesn't play nice or doesn't understand what the business needs to do. So what I mean by that is if you think of a typical development cycle, right? The, the IT department says, what's your requirements? And then the business says, well, what can I do? <laughs> and then we create this like cyclical process. So, so I think the other piece to look at is I, I think we're in a really exciting time because IT groups and IT departments, I, I don't think can continue to be siloed as like IT versus the business. I think you're going to see a lot more, like you see this in like some smaller startups and some other companies, but the reality is, is that IT needs to be a part of the business, meaning that the role, that, that's why I'm so excited to be on the IT side right now, because some of the challenges are 
you know, historically like, oh, we're IT and we're not the business. That's not our responsibility. And I'm like, no, no, it's, it's our responsibility as IT individuals to understand the business because we get the technology, we get the tools. And then for us to work with the business to collaborate on what the solution would be. And I think that's really where we start getting really good synergies and really good pieces on that with the change management, because in order for any, what I would consider program to be successful, you know, whether or not that's ERP or DAM or marketing automation, I believe that you need to have a strong technology partner and you need to have a business owner who is going to be driving the process. Right. That's awesome. So, it, so your your cheat code, if I could summarize a little bit, and I love this. You put the word "then" in between these. It's first, it's people, then it's process, then it's the technology. With those those three, then you sort of work in that order. Of course, you're going to constantly have to monitor, manage, operationalize, change for it to work. But that's the cheat code for the speed of success uh, in a digital ecosystem. Is that right? I, absolutely. And, and so an example I can give you of that is, so we, we have a, a request tool that people go in and request things like, uh, you know, POS or, or support materials for sales. And so within that request tool, previously it was just a flat database. And the flat database, okay, cool, now somebody does this, and they name the file on the folder, et cetera. Well, so here's where people process and technology kind of like come together in a really cool way. Well, on the request form, the person knows, okay, I'm requesting a, a POS item and that POS item is a stand up or a wobbler or whatever the specific item is, or maybe it's a, a video intro or whatnot. Well, I'm now forcing that person making the request when they choose those, those are the metadata values that are in my dam. So, Let's fast forward, okay, they put the request in. So one of the key things that we did with that request, instead of it now being a flat database, we also took and looked at what was happening within the graphics department. And what was happening is graphics would get to a certain point, they're like, okay, cool, we've got this, we're working on it. They go to the VP for approval. And the VP is like, what is this? What, what's this, why, why are you building this, right? <laughs> Always, why? And, and, so, and so, yeah, and they're like, well, you know, Joe over in sales requested it. And they're like, well, what does Joe know about our like marketing objectives? Like, you know, so the first thing we did is, is within the request tool, we actually have a pre-approval that goes to the brand managers. So somebody, anybody can go in and request, but those requests have to go through a brand manager. And the brand manager is the one who determines like, well, what's on my agenda? What are my high value items? Where am I going to get the most peace? And it gives them the control to say, okay, hold on. We're not going to have graphics spend time on this until I approve it. Cool. Okay. So now that's done. It's approved. It's gone through graphics. And so in our version one of the dam, the graphic designer would have to upload it. They'd have to put in the, the job number. They'd have to put in, oh, it's a, it's a graphics. It's a POS. It's a wobbler. It's a this. Put in the description and then click submit. Okay. So now here's people process technology come together. So now all the graphic design has to do, they have an upload button, drag and drop, done. And because, and because within the request, we actually put together, and, and this could be done with any request tool, right? This could be done with, you know, any of the tool sets that are out there from like a, you know, what I would consider a, you know, project management tool set. We just made sure that we aligned our data between the tool sets. So the request management system, if it was called, POS at our asset level, it was POS in our dam. And if it's called a standee in, in our asset subtype, it's called a standee in the dam. So that way, the request is exactly the same asset that's going to be uploaded. So when the graphic designer receives it, all they do is drop the file to say, oh, here's the bucket for me to drop the file. I'm done. <laughs> so yeah, you know, I, I, that, universal language. Yeah. So, so I think that's really the key piece there is, you know, understanding how do you take, you know, something that was like, you know, if you think about it, internal graphics departments used to get just a like an Excel form, right? Oh, I need X, Y, Z, and why do you need it? And what's the what's the description of it? Well, now it's an online form, and the online form now is aligned with the specific assets that we produce. So <laughs> that, that that's where you see it all kind of like molding together and coming together. 
That's awesome. That is definitely, I'll call it a happy path, a good scenario. Now, you t- now, if we could double click into the dirty data, I'm sure a lot of what you just described, this this um, this to be and or future state optimized now is eliminating or helping to reduce some of that that data integrity issue, the uh, the underpinning operational data. Is that, is that also true? Yeah, I mean, there's you know there's multi facets depending on where which area of the business we're talking about, right? So I, I think. Once you start gaining traction in a group, so so just to give you an idea, so six years ago, um, you, you know the way that we measure our metrics within the dam, we kind of we measure like how many people are logging in on a daily basis, how many people are unique users are using it over a month, et cetera. And you know the first six months, like if you were to look at my numbers, you'd be like, oh my gosh, that's you're not getting adoption. <laughs> yeah, usage is not you know, happening. Um, but you know, you fast forward six years, and the partnership. I mean, we have over eight hundred unique global users that use the tool today. Meaning that these are these are people who I have eight hundred different uh, individuals around the globe within our organization that are logging in on a monthly basis to access content, request content, um, and share content. Um, and for our organization, that's really big. Um, you know, I know a lot of people hear things from like, you know, people who work in like the movie industry and in Hollywood. It's like, oh, we got like 4,000 users. Cool. But, you know, your org is, you know, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people, right? When, when you're talking about an org that's, you know, 4,500 to 7,500 people and, and you've got that amount of individuals engaged around the globe, like you've built a tool that's working. And and we're only partway there, right? We're, we're, we're at the, I would say the, the next phase if, if you were to think about like starting as being in kindergarten you know we're, we're probably just about ready to graduate first grade <laughs> um and and i think understanding the uh the organize organizational um you know maturity that's really a key piece as well how within an organization can you understand how mature they are how open they are for change management and, and how are we going to move through this together? That is such a critical metric if it can be measured, but it's organizational capacity for change. It no, First of all, knowing what it is and then how to apply pressure in the direction you're trying to move. Um, super critical. I mean, people, then process, then technology. Like you said, you could get the best technology, advanced technology, bells, whistles, doesn't mean you're getting adoption. You really have to work that people process triangle actively. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So Kyle, this is uh, marking cheat codes. We like to talk about the core loop, which is um, that thing that keeps uh, gamers coming back to games. Do you have any history with Video games or even present? <laughs> uh, so, so when I was uh, a, a young boy, um, I had a Game Boy, and th- this is an interesting story. So, so, I don't know if you know Super Mario, but Super Mario, you, you saved Princess Daisy. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so, my my parents always give me a hard time because uh, when I moved out here to California and I met my now wife, her, her name's Daisy. So they all call her Princess Daisy. <laughs> Wonderful, <laughs> um, and and so we throughout my my life, I you know I was the one who had the PlayStation when when SOCOM first came out, and, you know, and, and doing the right when like what I would consider like you know lagging and glitching came along. Um, mm-hmm. You know, my big one was uh, Gran Turismo. I used to play that for hours on end. Like that was my you know cars and video games. Um, I don't. Do you remember Pitfall? Absolutely. Game? Yeah, so yep. I actually, uh, I was able to, I, I want to say my time was somewhere around 20 minutes and like 47 seconds, I believe, that I actually finished wow. the game in, you know, where, where <laughs> you could actually mail in your time, you can take a picture of it, and mail it into them so you can get on the uh, leaderboards. <laughs> so, yeah, so I've been, yeah, I've, I'm a big game today, you know, I, I do more uh, mobile gaming just because I can sit down for three minutes and, you know, do something versus, you know, sit down for three hours. Because once I get onto a console and start playing on 
my Xbox or whatnot, it's the night's done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Got to keep that dopamine coming. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, Kyle, thanks so much for coming on the show. Where can folks get in touch with you? Uh, they, they can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I, I, I'm around uh, doing stuff. I, I do a lot of, I've actually been working on some neat projects. Um, you know, I, I think I got introduced to you guys through David Lipsy, uh, who works yep. with, uh, does a lot of events. Um, you know, right now, some of the big things that were, you know, what I would say up and coming pieces, we've been working uh, with a lot of AI technology around uh, identifying images and products on shelves. Um, and then also figuring out how we can, I think the AI technology is amazing and it's a good uh, addition to your current work. But I, I think what a lot of people don't understand is it doesn't replace um, a human mind, right? <laughs> yeah. It's artificial. Um, yeah, yeah. So so I think the key piece is, is how can we, whether or not it's a CPG company or a product company or whatnot, how can we take this AI and actually build in an appropriate business case. I, I've been working on this little pet project for the last two or three years, and, and we're still kind of at that point where I'm like, this is cool technology, but I don't see how it applies to us uh, increasing revenue yet. And that's where I think really the, the, the next piece is, is, how can we take these technologies and understand how it affects our bottom line and what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Exciting. We're going to have to have a whole other show just dedicated <laughs> to that. There is so much to unpack on that project you're working on. Awesome, Kyle. Thank you so much. Appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks so much. <laughs>